So uh, my name is Richard. And I'm Raul. Hi guys. Uh, and we're, we're both based in the UK. Um, and very and sunny and hot place, isn't it Richard? <laughs> very sunny and hot place. If only, if only it was a sunny hot place. It's so cold in London at the moment that even though we're indoors, Raul's just asked to borrow my jacket to keep himself warm. And wearing a scarf as, as a thief. <laughs> okay. So we're going to be here to talk about generics, past, present, and future. And quite often when people see generics in Java, they have the same expression that this guy does. Richard, what, what happened to your street here? What did you do? <laughs> That's not my street. This is, this is somebody else's street. My street's fine. Yeah. But what happens frequently is they see something like this, you know, a binary search of list of question mark extends comparable question mark super T. And they think, what on earth is going on here? You know, who can possibly understand these generic things? And what we're here to do is make that a little bit easier and a little bit simpler to understand. And we're going to do that, first of all, by delving back into the past and saying, how did we get here? Why were generics added to Java as a language to begin with? Then we're going to jump forward to the present and talk about three kind of interesting features or uh, ways you can use generics that we don't think people use often enough, but which can benefit you in, in your development tasks. And then we're going to have a look forward to the future and see what upcoming changes there, well, some of them are likely to happen in Java 10, some of them might happen in other versions of Java, but what's happening in future with Java when it comes to generics? Let's get started with jumping the past, Richard. Yeah. So, do you remember 2004, Al? Do you remember the Facebook? I remember the World Cup in 2004. <laughs> Facebook World Cup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. Um, yeah, fantastic. Some developer UX here, but the zeros and ones in the design. Quite racist. Yeah. But what also happened in 2004 was generics were added to the Java programming language. Fantastic. So let's recap and remember why we did that to begin with. Well, if we go back to Java pre-generics, we might see some code a bit like this. We've got a list. We add some values into the list. And then we've got a loop here that loops over the list. Remember, for which loops weren't added until Java 5 as well. Vintage Java. Vintage Java. Vintage Java. Pulls out a value and prints it out. And if we run this code, it runs nice and fast. This Java has a good rec for doing. But we see it prints out the string A, as we'd expect, the string B, as we'd expect, and then it throws this nasty class cast exception. Hmm. Why are we getting a class cast exception, Raul? Well, Richard, obviously, it looks like you're adding strings in with your number here, and unfortunately, you're casting every element from this list back to a string. So obviously, there'll be a class between a number of strings. Um, but Richard, you know, to, to work around this problem, why don't we just create a, um, a string a list of string class and a list of integer class? <coughs> yeah, that's a good question. So we could, you know, solve this problem. The problem here is we're adding this number one to this list that should only contain strings, right? And we could try and solve this problem by having, I don't know, like a, a string list interface and a string list implementation, and then we'd only be able to add strings. But the problem with that approach is that it doesn't scale very well. Maybe we want a list of integers. Maybe we want a list of foods. Maybe we want a list of people. Whatever the type is. You want to have a list and say, the list only contains this type of object. So this is where generics come along. Generics allow us to let us add a type parameter and say, the list only contains this type of element. So we could say, a list of string. And that was added in 2004. And then the Java 7, the diamond operator was added as well, that lets us infer that it's an array list of string from its, from its context. And now if we run this code, it's great because we don't have that runtime error. So we've taken an error from runtime and pushed it to compile. Well, so what happens if you comment the output line here with the number? What will happen to that? So we'll see this little compile error here. And we'll see that we get the problem at, run, at compile time before we even run our program. So that's great. That's, that's improved the safety of our software. Right. Fantastic. So generics are both uh, reducing code duplication if you've got the same sort of a class which you want to duplicate for different types, and you also get verification. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
And in fact, we can think of this as being a kind of trilemma trade-off. You know, everyone loves their trilemmas, but we're going to apply it kind of specifically to the generic types here. We've got a concept of what we call static safety. So that means taking errors that happen at runtime and moving them to compile time. <coughs> We've got simplicity. You know, how complex is this feature when we think about it? And then there's concision. And we don't, when we say something concise, we don't mean Java is a really concise language. What we mean is you don't have to rewrite your string list and your integer list and all those different list types. And we can think about different programming languages as fitting into a different place in this trilemma. Things that have generics like Java, Scala, C Sharp, C++, they've got that static safety and concision, but they trade off the simplicity. There is complexity to, 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 to those systems. People who have languages that have like a string list approach, or for example, Phantom, which has generics, but only three built-in types of generic, uh, have simplicity and static safety, but they throw away concision. You need to do that duplication every time. And then there's dynamically typed programming languages like JavaScript, Ruby, Python. And they have simplicity and concision. They don't have to duplicate it every time. And it's nice and simple to think about. But they trade off static safety. So your program could error at runtime, whereas something like Java will stop that runtime error from happening. So it's always worth, when we talk about generics, we talk about where it's moving forward and what's happening. The thing about the context in which it was added to the language, and what's kind of motivational trilemma, how that works out. It's worth noting that actually the, the general programming language trend is moving more and more towards additional static safety, so additional complexity in the language. Uh, all those dynamic type programming languages, such as JavaScript, Ruby, and Python, have all got uh, type annotations now and proposal and tools around it to do compile time, type checking, and so on. Yeah, very interesting. Now, that was a long time ago, right? That was 11 years ago. So what's happened with generics in the 11 years since? What could people make use of, Brown? Well, so Richard, we're going to look at the, at the present. Uh, and we're going to review three interesting patterns uh, that you can make use of using generics in the day-to-day -day Java code. So we'll talk about intersection types, the curiously recurring generic pattern, which is really fantastic to bring up and push dinners. Uh, especially in London, obviously, and their work on. So we'll start with intersection types. So you know we can't see you guys right now, but I'm sure if we ask you to raise your hand and uh, think about Venn diagrams, we see all of you will know about them. So there's really sexy circles that are intersecting, and we've got a region in the middle. So that's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about a feature in Java called intersection type. And um, an intersection type was as follows. So if you look at this code name, so T extends A. This in Java means we want a type parameter called T that is a subtype of A. So when we say a subtype, we mean if A is a class, it extends A. And if A is an interface, it implements A. Precisely. And when you like to specify that T here is a subtype of both A and B, this is where you recognize the intersection type because it has a special symbol here, uh, the ampersand to indicate an intersection. So is this a useful feature? So we're going to look at a, um, a code example. Fantastic. So hopefully you guys can all see a wonderful idea here. So we've got a person class uh, here. And what we're trying to do is to read some information from the file. So we're going to deserialize uh, person, then we create person objects uh, from that file. So let's just run this to see uh, the output of this file. Fantastic. So we've just realized a person object here called Don Draper, 89 years old. Character from Marathon. Show was set in the 60s. He'd be really old if he was alive today. Really, really old. But how, how does this code work? So obviously we've got a, a, a read method here, which is taking the data input stream. So we look at this method and essentially opening the resource, reading the name, and reading the edge, and returning back a person object. Fantastic. So Richard, the software industry is quite uh, tricky these days, isn't it? Changes, it changes a lot. It changes, it changes a lot. A lot. So let's say that we've got a requirement change here which says, well, you know what? We'll also like to be able to deserialize those persons but from a random access file. 
So we find someone who's got a head, suddenly we've got a compile error. So what does this compile error say? It says, well, you'd like to use a method read, which is expecting a data input stream. But unfortunately, you're passing a random access file object, so we've got a type mismatch. Mm -hmm. okay. So one possibility, which we don't recommend, so if you pay by the number of lines of code, then you could <laughs> copy this method around and uh, you know, make use of the uh, random access uh, file object as, an, as a parameter to this method. Obviously, that would be bad practice, so let's see if we can do something better. Can we use the same uh, code logic here to pass multiple different kinds of types here? So let's find out if random access file and, find, and the data input stream have something in common. So I'm just going to investigate the class declaration a little bit. So we can see that data input stream is implementing a data input. So that's useful information. The file to input stream extends the input stream. And eventually, it's also implementing the closable interface. So, OK. So let's do the same exercise with the uh, random access file. The random access file is implementing data input and is also implementing closable. So the close method that we use in the read a person method comes from closable, and read UTF and read int come from the data input interface, right? Precisely. Okay, cool. So let's see if we can uh, create maybe a, a new interface, which is called um, data input. Uh, closable. And what do we need to do here? We, we, we need to say that it's actually ex extending both the data input. Yeah. And closable. Okay. Nice and simple. But we've got a problem here, haven't we? We have. Um, we'd love to be able to use this type here. So our method read now will take data input closable object. Unfortunately, a data input stream in random access file are not implementing data input closable. To do that, we need to have the master key of the JDK library and be able to retrofit, but we can't do that, obviously. Well, unless you choose to work for Oracle, which would be a brave career choice at the Swift career. <laughs> Indeed. So surely, we, 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 we should be able to do something better here. So we're going to introduce uh, an intersection type. So what we'd like to say is, actually, we want to type a dummy type that is both data input and closable. So we're going to add a type parameter here to, to this method. We're going to call it i. And we're going to say that i is both data input and also closable. Now we can use this type parameter here as an argument to the method read. And let's make sure we close uh, the intersection. Fantastic. So you can see here there's a compile error because it's saying, well, actually, uh, the source is something on tab i. So we'll make sure we use the tab i here. And the code seems to be compiling. So compiles, we should ship it, isn't it? Yeah, let's ship it. Let's see what happens when we ship it. So let's run this. Fantastic. So we're able to deserialize the person object from both a data input stream and a random access file by just reusing one single um, method. Fantastic. Cool. So we were able to effectively produce a situation where we had a dummy interface and retrofit that onto our other classes without having to add in a whole new adapter or without having to add in a whole load of boilerplate or our, our code. So that's quite, quite useful for that kind of missing interface scenario. But that's not the only you can use cases for making use of uh, intersection types. So you may recognize, um, you know, if we look at this code here, what does that mean? We've got a type T as an object and comparable. There's surely a comparable object is really an object. Mm. But more importantly, Raoul, what's happened to your door? That, that, have, the, have the builders, one of the builders done? That's not my door. That's not my door, I swear. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's shed some light on what this, uh, this code is all about. So you recognize the, uh, the confusing intersection here because of the ampersand symbol. You can see that it's saying it's both an object and compatible. 
So what have we got um, this? So to do that, we sort of need to step back in the past a little bit. And before Genrix, the signature for the MAC method was as follows. It takes a collection as a parameter. And you can see the collection is uh, not unified, so just collection, and returns an object back. And the object represents the element inside the collection that we have found. But what's really important with lab redesign here is that once you come up with a method signature, that the signature you step with to preserve binary compatibility in the future. That's the sort of method signature that the children will be looking for. Um, but it's worth pointing out that to be able to find the maximum element in collection, obviously those elements need to be comparable. You can't find a maximum otherwise. So the thing we can change the signature to something uh, a little bit more useful by explicitly saying that the elements inside the collections are comparable. So we've got a collection of comparable elements. And what we're going to return back is an elements collection that is also comparable. That makes sense. Well, the way generics are implemented in, in, in Java is that they get erased. So after Java C comes in, compiles the code to bytecode, the produce signature here is a max method that takes a collection as another and returns comparable. The return type is comparable, which is different to the previous signature before generics, which were returning uh, object. So we've got a, a, a binary incompatibility here. In order to, to preserve binary compatibility, there is a trick. The trick is if the first type on the left hand side of the intersection type has an object, that's the type that will be used by the Java compiler to produce a signature for the method. And this way it's preserving binary compatibility, but we also get a more precise signature which makes use of generics. So we have that. So that means anything that gets put in that collection has to be comparable, and you don't get a class cast exception at runtime. Precisely. Perfect. But the cost is that we have increasingly more complexity in the types we can have. And that's not the only use cases for making use of generics. Uh, for those of you who are making use of Java 8, uh, you might have seen uh, some code like this, so lambda expressions here. But more importantly, you recognize a little intersection type here that says that the returning lambda expression is also serializable. So we've got a, a comparator here that's pinned up by this lambda, and this comparator object has to be serializable as well. So this may be useful, for example, if you're making use of a of a tree map and you need to be able to compare the, the, the elements in, in your uh, data structure. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, Richard, can you explain to me what this door is doing here? This is not my door, Al. That's definitely not my door. And if it is, what the heck have I been paying those builders for anyway? That's terrible. Yeah. But you might well have seen this other pattern, this other one, you have one job confusion pattern. This enum of e extends e demo d. It's all over the place. In fact, I think there's a meme on the internet inspired by this e enum of e extends e of e, right? Some famous rapper, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yodog, I put type parameter in your type parameter so you could. Yeah. What are we actually trying to do here? Yeah, what are we doing, Richard? Let's, let's look at yeah. some maybe try to shed some lights on this curiously recurring generics pattern. So, we've got a uh, situation like this. We've got two confused people. And one of those confused people is called John, and the other one's called Bob. We, we apologize for the John and Bob's out there. It's not every John and Bob that's confused, it's just these two in our code base. And why is this John confused? He's confused because he can call his clone method. He returns something that's another confused person one. You can't assign back to that variable. And that doesn't make sense, right? Mm. If you clone someone, it should be of the same type that they've come from. And here's confused person two. Now, confused person two, Bob, you can clone Bob, and you get a confused person two back, and you can clone that clone. Okay? But Something about cloning people, which they never tell you in any of those Arnold Schwarzenegger films, is that you might want to be able to uh, think about abstracting over them. So you might want to say, hey, 
I can clone something, and then I can clone that clone. And that makes sense, right? Because if you get an exact clone of the original object that you were cloning, you should be able to clone them again. That's, that's the thing that, that, that should happen. This is the future. This, this is, is the future. future. This is the future according to uh, dystopian sci-fi. So we've got these simple examples, and neither of them compile. So let's investigate why that is and think about how we can make a generic solution to, to get them to compile safety. So Richard, maybe we should look at the declaration of confused person one for a second. So yeah. So confused person of one implements clonable string. And that doesn't make sense at all. Because if you clone the confused person, you should clone, you should get the confused person one back. But stepping even further forward, we can say why does that clonable interface allow you to return a string instead of that self type. So what we want to do is say clonable of t. So instead of saying just clonable of t, and that t could be anything like a string, we want to say that t has to be clonable. A clonable thing must return a clonable thing. So clonable of t extends clonable of t. Okay? And this means now that when we try and implement confused person one, we get a compile error here on the clonable of string. So let's replace that string with a confused person one and fix up the implementation inside this class correspondingly. Okay. Now when we go back to the to the main blob of code here, our main method, we will see that Bob's confusion has also been resolved. Because now our t extends clonable of t also means that something that's cloned can return something that's then clonable. So if we run this code, we see John and Bob being printed out on the command line. Only this time, they're clones. Arnold Schwarzenegger, eat your heart out. <laughs> they're, more clear, they're not confused anymore. They're not confused either. Fantastic. Yeah. And that's what we've termed the curiously recurring generics pattern. Now, if you ever happen to be at a dinner party conversation with a computer scientist, or if you want to find the, the technical term to Google on the internet to find more about this topic, it's called F-bounded polymorphism. Okay. We'll what come in on what F means. <laughs> <laughs> so, next uh, feature, question marks. Sometimes when I see generics, right, well, I see question marks all over the place. What is going on with the question marks? So I think that the idea of symbol is that everyone is really confused. And so we have a lot of question marks about this question mark. So what we're going to talk about are things like these that you may have seen. List of question mark XMT, question mark super T, or even, hell, let's let mess all of this together. Why not? This will extend the compound question mark super T. <laughs> what on earth is this stuff about? What on earth is going on here? And, you know, if we take our software engineering hat on, really what we want to achieve is always could we use and flexibility and create meaningful and easy to use API for our users. So that's what we're going to be looking at doing. It's all about subtyping. So we're going to use a, a different domain uh, to, to talk about uh, Wildcard. Let's say we're going to create a, a little application that needs to be able to log uh, different kinds of messages, text messages and email messages. So the first thing that we'd like to do is to um, log a, a message, so we um, the emails. The emails are, are very nice. Yeah. Um, and so in this problem domain, we've got an abstract class called message, and it's got two concrete subclasses. One of them is email message, and one of them is text message. And they both have a string body that's a message. Fantastic. So let's just run this so we get uh, on that. So we've got hello message just printed out. The reason for that is because we've got a, uh, a log method here, yeah. which takes a message and then use the two-string implementation of that message to, to print it out. So obviously this is not quite an enterprise-grade logging system yet, but it's just a simple code demo to get us going to begin with, nice and easy to understand. But if we're going to log messages, maybe we need to get a batch of messages coming through our system in one go. So how about if I wanted to log an array of messages? What would we do there, Raoul? 
Well, so what we can do here is to uh, declare a message array. Uh, we'll call it message arrays or messages, fantastic, and we'll create a, um, an array of messages that contain maybe one element. Let's say we only have only one. Okay, cool. And we'll make sure to, to add the elements uh, in, the, in the array. Okay, so we can put the first element in the message array. And what are we going to put in there? So let's say we're going to create a new text message this time. Okay. Fantastic. And so I by text. Um, and then we're going to log that message. Is that right? Fantastic. Yeah. So there's a method called log all. Take the message array. Great. And now let's run the program. And we see it loops over that array and logs all the messages. Okay. And we see hi, hi everyone to begin with, and hi by text. So that's nice. Um, but what about if I don't have a message array? What happens there? Well, so to make the, the example a bit more obvious here, let's say we're going to have an email message array. Create an email message array that contains only one element. And what we'd like to do now is to include the email message. Fantastic. So let's say we've got a, um, let's just run this and see what happens. Sure. And it works, doesn't it? Fantastic. So it's something quite interesting here, Richard, isn't it? Is that actually we pass in our email message array, but this method is expecting a array of message. So it turns out that actually the subtyping property we had before, where a message is expected, you could pass an email message or a text message. The same principle is being applied here with arrays. We're expecting an array of message, and we're passing an array of email message. So we get this sort of nice flexibility in our API. That's great. Does that mean as well that I can take uh, a message array called messages and assign it that email message array? It compiles. Fantastic. And if we run just that code on its own, it works fine. It still works. But let's make sure we use the um, messages here variable in the argument to the um, global uh, method. Yeah, make sure it still works. Yeah, that, that compiles too. But it's something quite interesting that we did here is that we are actually taking this array of emails, leaving on the heap all those elements or email messages there, and we're providing a different view to the array. We're saying actually there are messages. So potentially we'll be able to modify this array of message in the future. Hmm. So let's say we'd like to have a text message this time. So if I set the first message in my email array to be high by text. I'm trying to put a text message in my email array. What's going to happen? Compiles, ship it. Compiles, ship it to production, and close up in our face. Yeah, so we get an array store exception. What's going on? What does that mean? Well, so what's going on here is actually our messages here is backed up by an email message array. And we're trying to insert a text message there. So what happens if we're trying to access the first element of that array using this variable head, using the other reference message array? We'd expect an email message object back, but we're getting some text message. So obviously we broke the type system here. Uh, and that's one of the, uh, you could say arguably that's one of the sort of type system holes in Java. But in the past, before generics, that's actually a really useful feature. You know, if you want to create a, a method that finds items in, a, in an array, you may want to pass an array of integers or an array of strings or an array of uh, collections of T. Who knows? So that's actually a useful feature, but there's a, there's a, a problem here. We get runtime exceptions, but we prefer to get compile time errors. So what can we do? So let's talk about um, modern Java, so after the generics were introduced, so let's see if we can apply the same ideas using uh, the collection API. So we're going to use list. It turns out we have also a um, logo method here that's going to take a list of message. So let's just make use of this logo here, and we're going to pass a um, list of email messages. Okay. Fantastic. What happens? 
Yeah, what happens? Well, we get a compile error here uh, saying that we can't resolve the message log all list of email messages. But fortunately, that's because whilst that array's property was convenient, it was not safe. So we need to have a way of having a log all message that will let us take a list of email messages. Again, if we're paid by line of code, as you say, we just copy and paste it. But actually, we want to have a way of saying, we're only going to log messages, but we can log anything that's a type of message. Right? Precisely. And then the feature in, in JavaGenix which lets you get this additional flexibility, we're going to write question mark extends message. And that's a while call. You recognize them because of question mark. And that's what's happening. What's, what's happening here is that we're saying we want a list of anything that is a subtype of message. And now the code is compiled. So let's just run this and you know, we share it. We don't get the sort of real time exception. Fantastic. Cool. Right. We've, got, we've, got the right, we've got the right message here. And this would work with other things as well. So we could say log all text messages. And our list of text messages would work fine as well. Nice. So to get a little bit technical, you know, it's, all those dinners are really important, as we all know. And the sort of specificity here, sort of subtyping, we call it covariance. So arrays in Java are covariant because you could pass a new array of email message when a array of message is expected. But with generics, we said that generics are invariant by default. You can't have that subtyping property. To get this nice covariance flexibility, you have to make user welcome. But Richard, there's other more cards out there, aren't there? Yeah, let's, let's enterprise up our logging system a little bit. So um, I want to say add the ability to use a different type of function to print it out rather than just print out on the command line every time. So what, 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 what can we do here? Well, there is a nice um, functional interface introduced in general. It's called a consumer, which Ooh. is going to take some object and do something with it. So let's use that for enterprising network application. So we've got an interface called a consumer. It's got a single method on it called accept, and it just takes that type of thing. So it's useful for you know, perform an action on this single object. In this case, we're just going to use it for printing things. So we'll say printer.accept message. And then when we call log our email messages, we need to have some kind of uh, consumer of message here. Uh, so we're going to call that a message consumer, and then that's going to take our message parameter, and we're going to print out the body of that message. Okay, and then we can pass this message consumer as a parameter in here. That's nice. And if we run our code, we'll see we get hello by email printed out because that's the body of the, the email message. So hold on a minute. You know, if we can uh, print the, the body of the message, that's fantastic. Yeah. But let's say I'd be interested in actually printing using the two string definition of, a, of an object. Right. So what would we do? So you want basically a generic consumer that can print any type of object, like a default printer for our logging system. I'd love a consumer of object. Consumer of object. So say I call it an object consumer. And we could just use the Java 8 method reference feature here to reference the print line method of system.out. And you know, it's, it's a bit like dodgeball, right? Have you seen that film? There's a scene in it. He's teaching people how to dodge balls, and he throws wrenches at them. He says, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. And that's what we're saying here. If you can print out an object, you can print out a message. So let's try the, the object consumer. Just clarifying, we're not encouraging anyone to watch that movie if you have not <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we've got a compile error here, Richard. Yeah. Um, and it says, blah, 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 found consumer of object required consumer of message. So it says, I want a consumer of message. You're giving me an object. So obviously there's something interesting here because the message is an object. Yeah. You know, but here, we actually like to get sort of the reverse relationship. We like to say that a consumer of an object can be used when we've got a consumer of a message. So we want to say a consumer of an object is a subtype of a consumer of a message. That's slightly, you know, 
not very intuitive because we all used to do normal subtapping. Well, if you want to get a reverse relationship, you can use uh, the word card called question mark super. So here we're saying we want a consumer which can take anything that's a super type of a message. And as we know, an object will be a super type of a message. And it compiles and ship it. And if we run, we can see we've got the two string method call and the general system dot out equipment. So that's really useful. Uh, for the extends, this was safe for us to use in this situation and didn't cause the problem that we had with arrays because we were only reading values out of it. And it was safe to use the super construct here because we were only pushing values, writing them into our printer. Okay? Fantastic. Well, so that's not all with, um, with um, white cards in, in, in GenX. Um, the question mark super one is only one of the most interesting ones because you often see it with what we call functional interfaces. So interfaces that have only one single abstract method. So if you look at a comparator, comparator has only one single method called compare, which takes the type parameter as an argument. So like Richard is saying we're pushing values in the compare method. If we want to get flexibility, more flexible comparators, for example, a comparator of a message, a comparator of an object, then we always have to say question mark super to get this additional flexibility. But that's actually something that is not required because the same space here can only be used using question mark super. In the story of the predicate, you may have a predicate um, to test object, for example, whether a message is of a specific length. Well, you always have to specify question mark super to get the additional flexibility. And we'll revisit this topic uh, later on when we'll talk about the future and talk about declaration side variants. There's research on there that shows the adoption and use of generics. Uh, we, we were going to look at this paper called Adoption and Use of Java Generics. And what it shows is actually that 90% of generic users in million lines of code of open source projects 90% of the general users are just a list of string, a ring list of string, a hash map of string to string, a set of string. Isn't that fantastic, Richard? Well, I think what it suggests is that some of the features that we've been talking about in this webinar, whilst they're quite interesting, people don't necessarily use them. So hopefully, now we've explained some of the motivating use cases and the reasons why you might want to use them, this number will change over a little bit of time. Fantastic. So we talked about three useful things here. The intersection types, the middle bit of our Venn diagram, those extends A and B, the curiously reoccurring generics pattern, your dog, your clonable, and the wildcards, being able to take different types of messages and printing them out. So what we're going to do now is to jump in the future. Anyone remember this movie? Yep, I remember Back to the Future. And the thing you have to remember is that even though in the, the, the time version of the Back to the Future film, you can kind of jump back and forth and you have deterministic realities, our reality, the future isn't set yet. Okay? So, so we're going to be talking about features which could happen in the future version of Java, but which aren't, we can't get guarantees about what will happen there. It's just kind of indicative. So the first thing that we'll talk about is this kind of use set variance versus the creation set variance. The use side variance is what we've just seen with wildcards. You specify as a user how you want to make use of your generic classes. So for example, you want to have covariance for list. You want to customize the message. You need to specify that yourself in your code. If you're more flexible consumers, you need to opt in explicitly that you actually want your consumer here to be more flexible and take a cheaper type of message. So the benefit with the use advance is that you get a lot of flexibility. Given a certain class, you can decide whether to make use of extends or make use of super. The downside, though, is that you get additional verbosity in your code. The alternative is called decoration side variance. And that's the idea that we're pushing the virus complexity down at the library level. So as a user, you don't have to worry about it. So this is some, uh, you know, Roman syntax is a made-up syntax where we're saying that actually the consumer here will like the consumer to be always by default contravariant, so super of T. So be able to pass a consumer of a message or a consumer of an object here. 
of the Yitreta, it's a similar story. We're always pulling element out of the Yitreta. So we may want to use this covertly. So we could make a default at the library level instead of forcing the user to decide whether they want this to be flexible or not. So I see what you're saying, Raoul, that it's simpler if it pushes the complexity on to the poor people oracle and away from the rest of us 9 million Java developers. But is it really the case that you can just take these variance properties and push them to the declaration site? Does that work a lot of the time? So that's an interesting question because it really depends on how this type parameter has been used. What's great about consumer and trader is that the type parameter P here is used in a push position. So it's always contravariant, but the type parameter E here, we're always pulling it out. So it's always covert. But something like a list is slightly more tricky because you, know, you can both read and write to it. So it's not always the case that there's just one way of using this variance notation. Um, but Richard, there's some research as well on how those are being used. So that would be interesting to look at. Mm. Um, but to summarize this idea here is that use of variance is all about pushing complexity to users. But I can add the both in your code, declaration type variance, push at the library level. So that's really fantastic for us in the day to day. But it's not always the case that you can just use a specific class mm. in one way. But interestingly, that's what's adopted by C Sharp and Scala. And what I call Java is the only language that really makes use of that feature as a mainstream programming language. And there's a, uh, an, an enhancement proposal for Java to make use of declaration type variants which you can look at at this link. Um, that comes really useful, especially in functional interfaces that we're introducing Java 8. So we may or may not see that in, in the future. But what research shows is that actually uh, degression set variants can be quite useful in existing Java code. At least 27% of general classes, 53% of general interfaces, examining libraries have only one inherent variant type parameter. So it's either used covariantly or controversially. Question mark stands or question mark super, not both. So all those classes here and interfaces could be making use of declaration side variance to remove a boosty for users and get additional flexibility. So if you're interested in this topic and the empirical analysis, then we suggest you, you read this, this paper published at PLDI. Sure. But there's another thing which is kind of happening over time. I mean, this graph is a little bit old now, but it shows the trend, and the trend has only gotten worse since this, this graph was first published. And this is a graph showing the speed that your CPU can perform floating point numerical operations, that's the red line per second, versus the speed at which you can read data out of main memory, and that's the blue line. So this shows that over the you know, past CPU generations, over the last 10 or so years, CPUs are going faster and faster and faster at doing numerical or logical operations, but they've not been speeding up anywhere near as much at reading data out of main memory. And the result is that a lot of computationally heavy workloads these days are bottlenecked on getting data out of main memory and putting in the CPU. Now, for absolute donkey years now, CPUs have had CPU caches. These overcome this problem and reduce the latency from getting data out of, out of main memory by caching it in very, very fast but very, very expensive caches on CPU. Okay? But in order to be able to cache that data, your CPU needs to be able to predictively prefetch data from main memory to put it in the cache. So you need to know what data you're going to read next from main memory to keep it cached. Now, unfortunately, Java is not your CPU's friend. They're having a little bit of a war going on here. And the problem is that suppose we've got, I don't know, an array or an array list of data structures in Java. The backing spine on that array isn't the data, of, isn't the objects themselves. It's really an array of pointers, each of those pointers going to some domain object. So if we have an array of users, we'd have a pointer to a user, and from the user, they might have a pointer to an ID object and a name object. And the problem is for your CPU, it's very, very hard to predict where these pointers are in main memory without actually reading them and looking up the data. So it really gets in the way of you being able to prefetch that data. Whereas if you had what's known as sequential locality, where if the data was all aligned sequentially in memory, one, one element after another, 
it would be much easier for your CPU to prefetch that data because the access patterns in memory would be predictable. So, as a response to this, or one of the responses to this, is the idea of value type. So a value type is something which codes like a class and works like an int. What does that mean? It means it's uh, a concept to Java, but it would have methods and fields and things like that. But instead of it being identity-based with pointers going to different objects, it wouldn't have an identity in and of itself. It would just be a struct of values, like a kind of C star struct. Now, the reason why you might want to introduce this value type is for a couple of big wins. Firstly, the simpler to understand but less important win is the compactness. So it uses up less memory. Uh, objects have headers. Headers have what's known as a mark word, where it does things like locking on the object, because you can use that, you know, that synchronized keyword in Java, and class pointers, so a reference to the uh, uh, class information, internal data structure in your VM that's associated with it. Now, it depends on the JVM, but it can eat 16 bytes on certain types of JVMs, for example. That doesn't sound very much, but if you think about, say, a, just a basic primitive int, that's four bytes in memory, and then you need to have a 16-byte header, and then objects get aligned to eight-byte boundaries, your four-byte int gets a huge blow-up to a 24-byte boxed integer using six times more memory. And the much more important benefit is it gives us this sequential locality, this flatness in memory. Our value type can be laid out contiguously in memory, and we can have our user ID and name all one after each other in our array packed in nice and tight. So as we scan over that array, we can see each field one after another. Fantastic. Richard, that also means value types could be stack allocated as opposed to heap allocated. Yes. This is also another benefit we could have, potentially reducing garbage collection costs. Um, but in order to do that, there's some complexity. You never get anything for free in life. We've got to write a contract with the compiler where we use these value types in generic code. So what we can do here is, I don't know if this is the actual syntax, but this is a hypothetical syntax. We have to say to the compiler, look, this implementation doesn't just work for things like classes. It works for any type. So we might say an array list of any T implements a list of T. And what that means is, look, I promise not to use reference equality, you know, double equals. I promise not to use a synchronized keyword with this type and all the rest of it. Having agreed to make that contract, the compiler can now emit versions that work for both the value type and the boxed type. It also means we can do primitive specialization of generics. So instead of having to have a list of integer, we can have a list of int, like an actual primitive int that is an int array back to array in an array list, using up much less memory, getting our sequential locality, a nice speed improvement. And if you want to see more about this topic, there's a, a link we've got here to the state of specialization paper and to Project Valhalla, which is an open JDK project where the implementation of this topic is being explored and developed at the moment. If you're interested in it, I strongly recommend you go and go and take a look at Project Valhalla. So what's interesting here with the story is that typically when abstraction is added to the language, it comes with a performance cost. If you have to make use of a list of int, you have to box it to an integer, so it comes with a performance cost. But the Valhalla product trying to solve here is to provide both abstraction and also performance mm. in one go. If you're interested in any of the things that we've seen in this talk, we've got a bunch of uh, source code on GitHub. So any of the code examples that we've seen are available there for you to have a look at. And there's a, a few other topics here, which if you're just kind of looking more about the area, like unbounded wildcards and type bounds and problems around erasure, other things you might be interested in as well. But to conclude our talk, as usage patterns have changed with generic, generics, as other language features have been added. The things like lambdas mean that uh, the move to declaration site variants is more, is more useful because you've got those consumer things all over the place. You've got comparators all over the place. 
which are uh, have an inherent variance to them. As libraries get more and more complicated, so generic usage increases in scale and complexity. But it's okay. Most of that burden is on people writing libraries. But we kind of think that if you don't understand what's going on here and don't follow along with uh, the generic story, that you do become left behind. It's a little bit hard to understand what those libraries are doing. If you've got to read their documentation, for example, or perhaps debug them in, in, your, in their use of your, in your application. But the main thing that we kind of take away from our thoughts on generics is this idea that our static type safety has got this trade-off between simplicity and flexibility. As we add more features like the uh, declaration type variants, or more, more importantly like the uh, value types, we add more complexity to generics. In the value types, that gives us more flexibility. In the declaration type variant situation, we're trading off flexibility for more simplicity. But there's always that kind of trade-off. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, Raoul and I have uh, really uh, enjoyed giving this webinar today. I'm sure Lindsay will be back on in a sec to ask us your questions. Um, if you're interested in any further information about Java 8 itself, uh, Raoul and I have written a couple of books on that topic, Java 8 in Action and Java 8 Lambdas. Um, and if you're ever interested in talking to us face to face, we run a little business called iteratorlearning.com, which kind of teaches classes on that front. I've also got a couple of courses on Pluralsight, um, including one that I've recently released on generics. So if you want a more comprehensive, all encompassing overview of generics, that's on Pluralsight on, on that URL. And Raoul also runs the Cambridge Trading Academy, which helps teach kids in the UK and abroad now as well to, to take their first steps in learning how to code. So that's fantastic. So I presume there might have been some questions during this talk. Uh, Lindsay? Hi, Richard. It does look like we have one question. Let me go ahead and pull that up for you real quick. Um, Jay asked, does generic increase or decrease performance, and how much percent of Java devices support Java? Uh, let's see. I can't read this last bit. The first part was, does generic increase or decrease performance? And the second part is, how much percent of Java devices support Java devices? So what about backward compatibility? Okay, so let's take the, the, the first part of that question to begin with. Um, what generics does is it adds in a uh, runtime cast to that type. Um, so you've got a situation where you might have to have a cast where you wouldn't have one before. That's, I guess, the performance cost there that you bear at runtime. The, down, the, the, the reality, though, is that most of the time when people have that um, Cast. If, if they weren't using generic, they'd have to add it in manually if you use pre-generic Java. So there's not really much practical overhead in that respect. The other aspect of it is that they often force you to use these boxed uh, integer types, for example, as opposed to primitive ints. So that's the kind of cost I'm talking about when it comes to that temporal locality and the memory overhead. And that can be quite bad. But as I say, hopefully in Java 10, that's the kind of thing that will get fixed. Cool. Is there another question? Oh. Ah, yes. What will be the best software that's free to download for Java as I'm beginning in Java learning, then moving on to more comprehensive uh, Java later? So. I, I guess quite a good thing to download that's completely free and helps you learn to begin with is just uh, an IDE, for example. So Richard and I, you know, we make use of one called uh, IntelliJ, um, which is free to the community version. So yeah. use that. There's others out there such as Eclipse and NetBeans. You may, yeah. you know, you may choose. Everyone has their own personal taste there. So that's that's a great. Uh, piece of software to download that will help you getting going. Um, if you're looking for kind of introductory learning material, 
there is some material on small site, I think. The, the, there's just been a bit of a revamp of the core Java courses over the last few months, so that's always quite useful. In terms of other things that's, that's nice to get going, uh, I think probably it's not so much free software as much as libraries. And in Java, there's some good ways of getting libraries into your project, which are kind of the Maven and Gradle build tools. So they're both free and give you really easy access to a bunch of libraries. And then I'd also perhaps, if you're looking kind of for other software that's written in Java that's useful when you're getting going, the JUnit test suite is a fantastic test suite that's available. Um, and if you're using Foresight, I've actually recently done an introduction to test lead Java course as well. So that's, 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 that's great. But you don't even need to use that. You can, just the basic JUnit lets you write tests for software, makes them reliable, lets you drive your, your, your development through your testing. And it's a very useful free, free library. Cool. I guess that wraps up for the questions. Did yeah, you have I think that's all the questions we're time for. So if you guys have any um, closing remarks you want to um, say for the audience? Well, it was a real pleasure uh, to have this webinar with you guys. Uh, please do feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, if we can help you with anything, we're happy to answer any questions uh, for this talk. And um, see you guys soon. Thank you very much. Bye. And thank you, everyone, for your present. Or thank you, um, Raul and Richard, for your presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your participation and your questions today. Uh, if you have any questions about our webinar series, uh, please feel free to reach us on Twitter at Pluralsight or email us at webinars at Pluralsight.com. Again, as soon as you leave, you'll be prompted to take a very brief survey. We'd love to get your feedback. And with that, uh, we'll let you all go back to your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.